You know, for 23 years, 23 years, the man called Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, calls out to Judah about their sin, and they don't listen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hemmer. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are discovering the Bible today from 23 to 25th chapter of Jeremiah. We're going to focus here on the 22nd chapter. This is really interesting. And Corey and Ryan are here as well. Corey? Well, I'm focusing in on Jeremiah chapter 23 and the last few kings of Judah. Ryan? Well, today my segment's actually focused on the prophet Daniel, who, who lived around the same time as Jeremiah and who later used Jeremiah's prophecies to determine the end of the Babylonian captivity. Very interesting. Okay, Janice. God sent his word is the title of my segment today. All right. So take out the Bible guy, get your Bible out. Let's look at 25 and see what God is saying to us right now. Jeremiah 25, verses 1 through 11. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, this is the twenty-third year in which the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants the prophets, rising early and sending them. But you have not listened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Repent now, every one of his evil way and his evil doings, and dwell in the land that the Lord has given you and your fathers forever and ever. Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. Yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 1 through 11. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 20, chapter 21, and chapter 22. If you're watching this program for the first time, we're reading through the Bible, and that's what we're reading today. Now, today we're going to study and take Jeremiah 25, 1 through 11 here, and we're going to focus on that because God is speaking to us. One of the reasons the Bible is considered to be, or to contain, the voice of God is because of amazing prophecies in it. Its ability to foretell certain events and specific events, centuries before they happen. God is above time. He knows the beginning. He knows the middle and the end of all things. He created time. In fact, he created space. Now, some people have difficulty believing this. In fact, it seems to me that a lot of people will be believing anything except God. 
When we ignore the evidence all around us because of our own preferences or because of our hardness of heart, we will not win. It is one thing to critically think, this is good, but thinking deeply about issues and exercises and things like that, this really gets our minds and our faith going. And we believe that we will become more convicted to live like God or live for God. Now, it is another thing to be skeptical for skepticism's sake. When we lean into our hardness of heart, we will only become more hardened, deadened to our spiritual reality, deadened to thinking like God wants us to think. As we get into today, let me remind you that there is a separation taking place between good and evil, and there's very few people in between. And that's all dictated by the Lord. That's what he said he would do. And so today we're going to study that. Now take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. If you don't have one, we'll send you one. Write us or call us or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. But listen, God speaks the future. True, he speaks it into existence. But God knows the future. Jeremiah 25, 1 through 11. We need to pray. Father, I pray today that as we read this, you would help us to see the past shows us much about the future. Because in the past, you spoke across all of time. Whenever you preach through your prophets, it seems that you're preaching across all of time. Help us to understand what you're saying, Holy Spirit. We need to hear you today. And this is something that I pray for, Lord. I need to hear what you're saying. We talk about the 70 years of desolation that the people of Israel will be forced under and all of that. Lord, it's kind of a, a look at what we're looking at, Father. In Jesus' name, and we said together, amen. Now, let me ask you a question. What's the difference between 70 years and seven years? Just throwing it out there. Here we go. Jeremiah 25, 1 to 3. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, what a great king, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, which Jeremiah, the prophet, spoke to all the people of Judah. He spoke to all the people of Judah and to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, this is the 23rd year in which the word of the Lord has come to me. And I have spoken to you, rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. 23 years. Are you serious? For 23 years, Jeremiah cried out to the people of Judah, confronting their sins. They didn't listen. Beloved, we must listen to the Lord. We must listen to God. We must hear what the Lord is saying. We must listen to how God is speaking. We read the prophets. You know, some people take a certain section of the Bible and they read, that's all they read. No, we have to read the whole Bible so we get the big picture, so we understand what God is doing. It's like if you focused in on a little part of a picture, you'd see a little part. But if you pull out and see the whole picture, it's a totally different animal. I mean, it's a totally different picture. And that's what reading the whole Bible does. So keep that in mind. Very important. Jeremiah 25, verses 4 to 7. Look at this one. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear them. They said, repent now, every one of his evil way and his evil doing. Send dwell in the land the Lord has given to you and to your fathers forever and ever. Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands and I will not harm you. Yet you have not listened to me says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Which brings me to this point. 
God spoke to Israel over and over again through his prophets. And we can read those prophets in the Bible. The Lord continues to speak to us through his word. We should repent. What does repent mean? It means that you're not for sin. That you have a meeting with yourself and you say to yourself, hello self, I'm against sin. And yourself says, well, wait a minute, I like sin. But you say, no, I'm against sin. And you have this conversation. And you can't do anything about it, but the Holy Spirit then comes into you. And then suddenly, your old self goes away. And you begin to work towards God. That's what repentance is. That's what it means to repent, beloved. Jeremiah 25, verse 8 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all of the families of the north, says the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants and against these nations all around and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing and a perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of bride and the sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Spoken by Jeremiah. God told the Israelites about their 70-year exile long before it actually happened. Long before. You see, the Lord will do what he says about our willful sins. Again, I say to you, it would be wise if we repent. It would be wise if we repent. Father God, I pray today that you would help us. Father, we're not for sin. Help us to live the way you've given us. And that doesn't mean what some people think. But Lord, we need to live according to what you said. And as we read your word and learn what you said, help us to do that today. And we will become people more like you on this day. Help us, Father. And we all said together, Amen. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. Anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. As I was reading Jeremiah chapter 23 today, uh, it really hit me, you know, God's use of, of, of shepherd imagery to describe the kings of Judah. And also the shepherds, you know, in, in other passages, it stretches out to the priests as well. But the overall idea is these people who were supposed to be leading the people in good paths, providing sustenance for them, protection from them, leading them to God, and yet they're not. So uh, chapter 23 opens up with a woe, woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. So jumping off of that, you and I are going to be taking a look at the last few kings of Judah and Jerusalem that Jeremiah knew and for sure chapter 23 talks directly about. The last four kings of Judah ruled over uncertain times from their capital city of Jerusalem. They bore the famous lineage of David and Solomon, and while their citizens remained loyal to the royal bloodline, the monarchy had undoubtedly lost much of its power. Jehoahaz was the 16th son of Solomon to take the throne of Jerusalem, and his short-lived kingship was all in thanks to the political aspirations of his father, King Josiah. Josiah was a godly king, but he had died in battle trying to influence world politics. The Egyptian army was marching to Carchemish to support the last-ditch effort of Assyria to resist the rising Neo-Babylonian Empire. Since Judah had long been subject to Assyria, Josiah was hoping to see Assyria and Egypt defeated. 
In reality, he only succeeded in swapping overlords for his sons. Jehoahaz lasted a mere three months on the throne before the Egyptians stopped at Jerusalem, took him captive, and replaced him with his brother Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was now an Egyptian vassal king. He was allowed to rule over a Judah loyal to Egypt and had to send yearly tribute to prove it. Three years into Jehoiakim's reign, he was forced to switch Jerusalem's allegiances again, becoming a Babylonian vassal in the face of the Babylonian military. At this point, the prophet Jeremiah warned against any rebellion, but to no avail. Ever loyal to the pharaoh that had made him king, Jehoiakim eventually rebelled against Babylon. Quickly after this rebellion, he died or was murdered, leaving his 18-year-old son Jehoiachin to deal with the Babylonian response. It didn't go well. Jehoiachin, most of the royal family, courts, royal wealth, soldiers, and skilled craftsmen were taken away to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar did all but destroy the city. He left what he thought was a thoroughly humiliated people who knew the consequences of rebellion. He appointed 21-year-old Zedekiah of the royal family to be his new vassal king. For Zedekiah, the writing was on the wall, or more accurately, in the books of Jerusalem's prophets. He rebelled by defaulting on his tribute payments, resulting in a two-year siege and the destruction of Jerusalem's wall, city, palaces, and the Temple of Solomon. So I hope that this has helped you get in your mind the timeline of what Jeremiah is living through. You know, he, he knew so many of these last kings of Judah in a really personal way. And, and that, that comes across here in the scripture and throughout the rest of the book of Jeremiah, you know, him actually living not only through their reigns and some of their successes and a lot of the mistakes that they made, but he, he witnesses the culmination of his prophecy as well before ultimately moving on to Egypt and kind of dropping off the, the pages of history. It's very, uh, very interesting, Corey. Mm -hmm. These pieces are absolutely excellent. Both your pieces are great. You can watch them on Bible Discovery TV. That's a great uh, website. You can watch them there. It's called the, what would he call them there on Bible Discovery TV? They're called the what? Spotlights. Spotlights. Yeah, okay. that's right. So go there and check it out. Ryan? All right. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, I have a riddle for you today, and it involves numbers. See, Daniel 1.1 says that Nebuchadnezzar first besieged Jerusalem in the third year of Jehoiakim's reign. But Jeremiah 46.2 indicates that this happened in Jehoiakim's fourth year. Now, believe it or not, both passages are correct. But how is this possible? Well, let's find out. The Jewish prophet Daniel was among the first group of captives taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC. He was young, good-looking, intelligent, and full of social graces. And according to the Jewish Roman historian Josephus, he even belonged to the royal family that produced King Zedekiah. Nevertheless, Daniel was soon to be stripped of that identity and assimilated into a full-fledged Babylonian. As a part of the brainwashing process, his name, which means God is my judge, was changed to Belteshazzar, meaning Bel protect the king. And he was probably emasculated as well. However, though they changed Daniel on the outside, they could not change his heart. As a matter of fact, though Daniel was probably no more than 17 years of age at the time of his deportation, he was already a man of tremendous faith and integrity, whom God had blessed with knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom and understanding in all visions and dreams. As a result of these unique gifts and characteristics, Daniel was made governor over Babylon and throughout his lifetime was able to influence as many as 13 kings and four kingdoms. And wicked though most of the kings were, Daniel's counsel, courage, and absolute integrity often turned them away from idolatry and led them to recognize the power of the true God. This was seen most dramatically in King Nebuchadnezzar, who, after several unfortunate episodes, finally humbled himself before the Almighty and proclaimed him alone as God. Though by the time of King Belshazzar, Daniel was no longer a part of the government, it would be he who interpreted the writing on the wall. The drunken and revelous Belshazzar had been weighed and measured, and found severely lacking. So God divided his kingdom and gave it to the Medes and the Persians that very night. With Belshazzar now dead and Darius the Mede firmly established on the throne, Daniel is once again re-established as ruler over the entire realm. Although he ends up being cast into a den of ferocious lions as a result of some jealous conspirators, God shuts the mouth of the hungry beasts, and Daniel was brought out alive and unscathed. 
King Darius, amazed and relieved, honors the god of Daniel, and in turn has the conspirators, as well as their families, cast into the lion's den to be destroyed. Daniel would go on to prosper in the reigns of both Darius and Cyrus the Persian. Truly, Daniel was a man of rare faith. Indeed, his contemporary Ezekiel placed him in the same ranks as Noah and Job. In fact, by faithfully studying the prophecies of Jeremiah, another of his contemporaries, Daniel realized that the 70 years of Jewish captivity were about to expire. And through his faithful prayers, the angel Gabriel appeared to him, calling him greatly beloved, which is the same way Jesus referred to the Apostle John. As Dr. David Jeremiah observes, Daniel and John also share another parallel. They are the two greatest sources of prophetic revelation in the Bible. Because of their faithfulness and obedience, God disclosed revelation to them, not given to any others. You know what I love about Daniel is that he lived most of his life in a pagan nation, Babylon, but he remained totally positive and obedient to the Lord even when persecuted. He wasn't afraid of men, only of God. Just as we can take Jeremiah's life as an example of how we as believers ought to live, we can do the same with Daniel. Our world today is a lot like the one that these prophets were living in. The world seems to be offended by everything but sin. And so my prayer for all believers is, Lord, help us to be like Daniel and Jeremiah, who were obedient and imitators of you. Lord, help us to remain faithful to you and to proclaim your name no matter where we are, because when we proclaim your name, people witness the power of the living Lord Jesus Christ, the God of heaven and of earth. Amen. You know, Daniel is a incredible prophet. Mm. He truly is. He's somebody who uh, prophesies and his whole life is presented by the time he comes into Babylon. He's likely a teenager. Uh, by the time he is mentioned in the lion's den, he's probably in his 80s. Yeah. So it really is interesting. And he prophesies and he is given a vision by God. Daniel is. We're going to read about him in the next few weeks. He's given a vision by God that so is so true, it upsets him. Hmm. Yeah. And he can't even think straight. I mean, he, have, he but he has to write it down. Yeah, Isn't it's, that it's, something? It's an amazing chapter. And I, I'll just say one of the greatest commentaries that I've ever read on the book of Daniel is by David Jeremiah called Agents of Babylon. And if you haven't read it, I, I definitely recommend it because it's just, it's, it is a really detailed account of basically what happened. Yeah, you know, and David, let me just say that David Jeremiah is an outstanding uh, speaker and pastor. He's just a great guy. Uh, I don't know him. I've never met him. I've seen him a few times, but uh, uh, he is just a great one. And he's he's got a book, and that's one of them. He's got many books. So, you know, it's something that we need to keep in mind. But Daniel is great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He is truly, truly One of my awesome. favorites. <laughs> yeah, he is. Uh, and uh, it's it's where I'm looking forward to getting to Daniel. When we get to Daniel, mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun. Okay, Janice? Yes, so God sent his word is m what my segment is called today. And um, as Rod started at the top of the program, he mentioned about Jeremiah speaking for 23 years. And, you know, as we go through the Old Testament and we see that God sent his prophets to speak his word to his people. And we see that here. Jeremiah is saying, the, the word of the Lord has come to me and I have spoken to you rising early and speaking, but you have not listened. And the Lord has sent to you uh, all his servants, the prophets rising early and sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to hear. God sent his prophets to speak his word to his people. And as we get into the New Testament, we know that God sent his only son, who was the word the living word in flesh. We can go to the Gospel of John. For those of you that are new to the Bible, if you are new to the faith, if you are new to this program, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Listen to this. It's talking about the one, Jesus Christ, who we believe is God's Son. In the beginning was the Word. So this is the very beginning of time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. I'm going to jump down to verse 14, the word becoming flesh. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
That's when Jesus came through the Virgin Mary, his birth here on earth, fully man, fully God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God sent his word and we have it here in print in our Bibles. And that's what we're, this program, Bible Discovery, that's what we really want to do. We want to discover what God has said to us. And we don't have all of the answers, but we study together with you. We're all students of the Bible learning together. And this ministry, this program that you're watching, was really founded on a scripture that we read in Psalm 107.20. And I'm going to also extend it and read verse 21. He, that's God, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And Rod, this is our 32nd year going through the Bible. Your father back in 1990 started something called Project 90 because the president in the United States in that year declared it the, the year of the Bible. And so your dad started going through the Bible. At the end of the year, there was so much, um, many people that wanted to continue that you know what, it's been going on for 32 years. So what a blessing it is. As you've just seen the prayer request put on the screen, that's very important. Praying is a critical element today. Read your Bible and pray, read your Bible and pray. Let's pray together, you and I, and let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, help us to live for you. Change my love for selfishness into love for others. Love for you first and then help me to serve others, Lord. This is what we pray today in Jesus' name, amen.